Yeah, so uh, I'm Ace. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the SEP Plus, um, uh, which is, um, we'll, we'll come to it, the, the, the next slide. I'll give you an, a bit of introduction about SEP first. Uh, so the SEP is a multidisciplinary learned society. We're bringing together organizations and individuals with an interest in underwater technology, ocean sciences, and offshore engineering with a global outreach. Uh, so the SUT Plus uh, is a subset of uh, the main SUT society uh, for young professionals. So we're created for developing uh, professionals, graduates, and students by developing professionals working in the subsea industry. So our aim is to increase newcomers appeal and understanding of the underwater technology and related markets, SUT Plus, provides a platform to develop valuable industry knowledge outside the traditional office environment. SET Plus it provides a program of events throughout the year to promote and extend awareness of the subsea industry. Uh, so please, uh, if, you, uh, if you enjoy this uh, event, uh, you can reach out to us and uh, you can follow us on uh, LinkedIn uh, and you can get in touch if you want to uh, to help us uh, with what, and what we're doing. Um, and uh, please, before we start, uh, just to, to let you know, uh, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, so please uh, mute your microphones or just keep it muted. And uh, please don't share your videos. And if you have any questions, uh, we will address them at the end. So please drop them in the, in the Q&A box uh, that you will find uh, on Zoom. Cool. So uh, uh, now I'll uh, I'll pass it to uh, Neil, who's going to give us the presentation today. Uh, Neil, would you please start uh, by giving uh, a bit of introduction about yourself? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ace. Um, so my name's Neil Douglas. I'm one of the founders and um, current director of Viper Innovations. Um, I prior to Viper, I've I've had 20, 22 years in the subsea controls and umbilicals industry. So um, I guess I'm showing my age now, but I do have some experience in, in this sector. Um, a little bit about Viper Innovations. We, we were set up, established in, in 2007. Uh, so we, we had our 15th anniversary. Um, earlier this year, we, we employ about 65 people and um, the majority of, our, majority of our employees are engineers. Uh, working in the in the subsea sector, but I guess I don't want to say too much about myself. Uh, we've got a, a presentation to get through. Hopefully, it is um, going to be of interest. Um, as I say, I'm definitely not a marketing presentation. Uh, but if let me try and share my screen. Um, no, I'll be there in a minute. This worked so well beforehand, didn't it? Uh, if you can just let me know, Ace, if that is good. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it now. All good. Okay, thank you. So the title of this presentation is, is The Consequences of Electrical Insulation Failures and Aging Umbilicals. Um, most subsea engineers have heard about uh, in electrical insulation and uh, low insulation resistance or low IR. Um, so I'll give a little bit of an overview of what insulation resistance is, uh, why it's important, but the purpose of this presentation is, is really to talk about the, the consequences of what it means if you do get a low insulation resistance in your umbilical. And I guess the title of this um, gives away the answer, copper loss and hydrogen generation. So um, one introductory slide, uh, we will be talking about a couple of these products later on. Uh, so so I've, I've said a little bit about Viper Innovations, um, as well as working the subsea industry, we have diversified and, and also sell products into the uh, railway industry. Um, uh, and again, that is all associated with 
electrical cable integrity monitoring and reporting. Um, there's, there's two particular products which I want to flag up on this slide. Um, the first is V-Life, uh, which we will come on to right at the end of the presentation, which is one solution available to the operators when they do have low insulation resistance. And then the second product, uh, V-LIM, uh, line insulation monitor is what's, what the LIM stays for or, or stands for. And again, I will explain um, why line insulation monitors are used or, or insulation monitoring devices is another, is another terminology. So two, two products or, or, or one product and one service which we provide as a company. Right, some basics. When we talk about power distribution systems, <coughs> excuse me, um, and specifically, this is power distribution going from top sides of platform or the FPSO down to the subsea field, we've got a number of basic electrical decisions to make. The first is that AC alternating current or DC direct current that we send down the umbilical. And then if it is AC, is it a single phase supply or is it a multi-phase supply? And then the final decision is what type of earthing arrangement do we need to deploy on our system? Now, I'll come back to earthing arrangements but it, because it is pretty key uh, to this presentation. But I've got three bullet points there and, and, and it's obviously very generalized. Most subsea control systems are single phase AC ungrounded IT systems. Now that's not information technology. Uh, I will come on to what an ungrounded IT system means, but typically at single phase, they are operating below 3000 volts. And if I'd have made that number uh, 1200 volts, it would probably have covered 95% um, of the single phase AC systems out there. When you have long offset uh, umbilicals, cables, and when I'm talking long offset, probably beyond 60 or 70 kilometers, you will typically see the subsea controls providers um, going to three phase AC systems. But again, it is always an ungrounded IT earthing system that is utilized. And then a final bullet point there, for those who are familiar with uh, the old um, one subsea or, or, or Schlumberger, uh, controls out of cellar, they are typically uh, supplying DC systems. So they're all electric tree and their subsea control systems are typically DC supplies. Now, what is what do I mean by an IT system? So it comes from a definition which the IEC have set up and they utilize effectively two letters to define the earthing system of any network. And what you can see is that the first letter defines the connection between the supply and earth. Is there a connection or not? And is it connected to the neutral? The second letter is talking about the connection between the earth and the consumer, so at the far end. So for an IT system, the first letter I stands for isolated, so the supply is isolated from Earth, and the second letter T means that the, uh, the T, sorry, I should say T in this step case stands for Terra. Now, apologies for all you French speakers, because that was my impersonation of uh, the word Terra, which is French for Earth. So if it's a T, it means it's connected to Earth. So in this middle one, you can see that the supply, the first letter is T, the supply is connected to Earth, and so is the consumer connected directly to Earth. What is more common in the UK utility supply. So what you will see um, at it, within your house is the supply is connected to earth uh, and the 
at the far end, the consumer is connected to actually Earth at the neutral point. Hence, we have this TN configuration. So this is typically the configuration you have in your domestic house. And this is typically the configuration you have in most industrial applications. So um, if you go onto a building site, you see builders there with their little yellow boxes, transformers. Those boxes are converting a TN supply into an IT system. So the obvious question is, why do you use IT uh, distribution systems in preference to uh, TN on industrial applications? So again, a whole number of bullet points. I'm not going to read through them all. Uh, we've already said that IT systems have no deliberate electrical connection to earth. So it's completely isolated. And the important thing is that you can have a continued supply on a first ground fault. So if we go back to our previous uh, system, if we have L1 or L2, connected to earth through a ground fault, all it's doing is turning an IT system into a TT system. You can see, I mean, it's showing the earth on a TT system at the source, but if that L2 or L1 was connected to earth, we end up just converting from an IT system to a TT. So theoretically, a first ground fault, you can continue operating without any problems. The Ground current should be very small. Um, I say that with a caveat, um, and I do have a second presentation on this, but once you get to long umbilicals with a high capacitance, you can and do end up with very high ground currents on a first fault. Theoretically, if you just look at the schematic, you, you, you don't see why, but if you start then building up the um, the cable or the umbilical with, with a lumped uh, model showing the inductance and the, and the capacitance, you can quite easily prove that you can get a very high fault um, on a first ground, oh, sorry, a very high fault current on a first ground fault. If a second ground fault occurs, so this is, this is a key thing now uh, with industrial applications, it can lead to potentially dangerous body currents. Um, and if you've got a multi-phase system, uh, some pretty obscure voltages, phase-to-phase -phase voltages that occur, which can lead to high electrical stresses. So industrially, uh, we say that a first fault must be fixed as soon as possible. Now, if I go back again to the previous slide, just to describe how the industrial in an industrial building site or, or an industrial site of any form is safe. If you have an IT system, an individual can come along and, and grab hold of conductor L1 or L2, and all they would be doing is referencing that conductor to Earth. There would be no current flowing through them, it would be perfectly safe to do so. So you can see that an IT system is generally much safer for users, for individuals. On the TN system in, in your domestic household, you know that if you touch the neutral, it's already at ground potential, you do not get an electric shock. However, you, if you touch the live conductor, you most certainly do get an electric shock. Hence, it's not the, the, the domestic supply is not as uh, resilient or tolerant uh, to uh, individuals touching and not getting an electric shock. So having described or told you why IT systems are important, we now need to look at the legislation. And, and I am building a story here. This, this looks a pretty boring slide quoting I, I, IEC numbers and different parts. But fundamentally, if you have an IT system, you absolutely have to have a suitable protection or monitoring device installed. So if your offshore system complies with international standards, uh, you have to have a protective device. Now, 
domestically or, or in the building site, you would just use a, a residual current device. Uh, that works on very short cables. However, as soon as you have capacitive leakage, which you do on a long umbilical, those RCDs uh, will be tripping as soon as you turn the system on. So for that reason, RCDs are never used on electrical supplies for subsea systems. We always use what is known as an IMD or insulation monitoring device. So this device, the IMD, effectively monitors the integrity or monitors the earthing, um, the, the leakage to earth, and then alarms in the first instance and gives the operator an ability to act on that alarm, either automatically or manually to isolate the system. Now, um, I mentioned VLIMS, or uh, uh, LIM, Line Installation Monitor, and I've also mentioned IMD. These are two different terminologies for the same device. And offshore, for subsea systems, uh, you are likely to see probably three of these six that I've shown here. Um, so on the top right is, is our own product, the VLIM. Uh, top left, we have Bender, uh, who supply a number of different uh, line insulation monitors or insulation monitoring devices. And then finally, in the bottom left is a Megacon device, which some of the OEMs have put in their uh, topside power units. So whilst I put uh, six different manufacturers and devices up there, uh, what we actually see in the subsea market is, is predominantly two, the Viper and the Bender device. And then uh, now and again, we will see the, the Megacon device. So this is just to let you know, there are a range of different insulation monitoring devices on the market. What I'm going to do is simply describe what an IMD does or a line insulation monitor. And we've got this electrical schematic. So I apologize for the non-electrical engineers. It does get more interesting for the non-electrical engineers, believe me. Um, but in this grayed out box on the left-hand side is a very simplified circuit model of the insulation monitoring device. And it is a voltage source that has an internal impedance. In this case, I've just shown it as a resistance. Now, I've said it's simplified. That voltage source, it may be an AC voltage, it may be a DC voltage, it may be pulsed signals, it may be a very complex signal, but there is a voltage source driving, <coughs> excuse me, current through this internal impedance between one of the conductors in the umbilical. So it's always connected to at least one conductor in the umbilical, so I've called it L1 here, and ground, earth. So the IMD or a limb is connected between earth, the, the, the legs of the, of the platform, and one of the conductors of the umbilical coming up. Now, theoretically, there are three types of current, three leakage components where that current goes. One is the resistance, so the insulation resistance, a resistive component. Secondly, there is a capacitive component, so current's obviously at 90 degrees back. Um, and that is uh, known as the insulation capacitance. Sorry, I should go back here. I've tripped on what I shouldn't have done. And then the final component is, is a little bit more complex but that reflects the dielectric absorption uh, element of the insulation material. So this is current that is going from the conductor through the insulation material around the, the cable to seawater or the, the armor of the cable. So whilst it's a, a relatively simple <coughs> voltage source, you can see that if you apply different AC signals, you can actually work out what the insulation resistance is, the insulation capacitance, and the dielectric absorption uh, of, the, 
of the cable. So there's some basic electrical uh, calculations and then we can end up reporting those, those three elements. If we simplify the umbilical, this is how I really now want you to think about it, where it is the, the predominant leakage current is the resistance, the insulation resistance. And when I say it's dominant, if the umbilical is new, it may be capacitance, it may be resistive. However, as the, as the umbilical deteriorates, maybe water ingress, it is the resistive element that predominates the umbilical or the, the leakage. So from here on in, I'm just going to look at assuming that the leakage current is resistive. And when I talk about insulation resistance, this is really what I'm talking about, this resistance here. And one other thing I want to just flag up now, um, because we will come back to this, the actual level of current that is being driven from the IMD through the insulation is a function, as you can see, of the voltage applied and the internal resistance. And depending on what the insulation resistance is and whose insulation monitoring device you select, uh, that governs the amount of leakage current. So I've just put this table up. We will be coming back to this because the level of this leakage current um, actually has quite a detrimental effect on the umbilical. So we have set up, and, and this looks a very simple experiment, it is. What I have done here is put a, you can see it's a, a piece of, I think it was one and a half square mil cross-section area uh, laboratory wire into a beaker of seawater. Um, there's a steel rod in the beaker of seawater and that represents, if you like, the, the platform leg or the hull of the FPSO. This cable represents your umbilical or your cable within your umbilical. And what I've done is created a small hole in that cable so that seawater penetrates into the cable. And on the right hand side, this unit that you see here is a line insulation monitoring device. And it is connected to the cable and to this piece of steel. So what we are doing from this device is just driving current through the cable and through this little hole, back up to the earth, and then back to the device. So it's a relatively simple electrical circuit. After just two weeks, we took that cable out of the seawater, and you can see some copper corrosion on the surface of the, of the wire. And this was with an insulation resistance of 30 kilo ohms. So we, we, we made a scientific hole using a pin uh, in, in, the, in the material. It, we measured the insulation resistance, it was 30 kilo ohms. And after just two weeks of energizing that cable or monitoring that cable, I should say, with the line insulation monitoring device, we ended up with copper corrosion. Now, it's not surprising. So if, and this is where we go back to our, I guess our, a level chemistry. What we have is the IMD as a power supply. And I've shown it here as a DC power supply because it helps um, understand what's happening. But even if it is an AC signal, they are generally very low frequency AC signals. So you can consider it as a, a battery that is being reversed every, every few seconds. But Let's just assume it is a DC that's being applied. The anode is a copper conductor. We're in a seawater environment. And the cathode is that piece of steel which is sticking in the water. Now, we can go back to our A-level chemistry, but we have, as a result of driving current or electrons through the steel cathode back to the anode. We are also dissociating the 
um, the ions, or, or sorry, the, the molecules within the seawater. And what we end up with is that copper comes off the anode, it goes into solution down here, here's the, the equation at the bottom, and then ultimately deposits itself on the cathode. And then also, again, another interesting um, thing that is happening is that at the cathode, we have the dissociation of hydrogen H2O into um, the hydroxide ion and the hydrogen atom, we get com combination of the two hydrogen atoms to create hydrogen being emitted at the cathode. So theoretically, just using your A-level chemistry, we would expect copper to leave the conductor transfer across to the earth or the, the cathode and also some hydrogen being given off at the cathode. So that same piece of wire, what we then did, we took off the outer insulation. Now, um, what I will say is we, we use some, some wire strippers to take off the insulation or to hold the insulation or we cut it off. But interestingly is what we've seen inside. So this is really just empirical evidence of the theory that I've just given you about the electrochemical cell that is set up. And we, we noticed two things, <coughs> excuse me. One is the strands, we've got some broken, broken strands here and those have not been broken um, as a result of us stripping the wire back. You can see if we blow up what's happened, you can see the copper corrosion and that the corrosion has actually caused even through the strand. And then the other thing we're seeing is some salt, uh, which is obviously what's happened. You know, water has gone in uh, through that hole into the interstices of the wire. And then when the wire is dried out, we've ended up with salt. So it's just verification that salt water is getting in as a result of salt water getting in and us measuring the insulation resistance, we get some pretty horrendous copper corrosion. So then what we did was uh, put two wires, so the if you like the L1 and L2, into the same seawater uh, container, and this time we applied just 220 volts. So our, our mains, we connected those two wires to the mains. And again, what we did, we put um, damaged both wires. So both of them now have uh, small holes in them. I think the, 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 sorry, if I go back again, should not have done that. The, um, the total IR, I think it was, it was 60, 60 kilo ohms on each, so 30 kilo ohms total insulation resistance. And what we saw in the beaker was hydrogen bubbles. So we physically saw hydrogen coming out of these holes and going into solution and, and bubbling out of the beaker. So again, we can physically see what's happening with the hydrogen. And here again, uh, you can see one of the wires, it's not showing the big green uh, copper chloride deposit that we saw in the previous experiment, but you can see it black um, and there's something going on within that cable. There's the two cables. Uh, one appears to be uh, more susceptible to, uh, to damage than the other, but what we then did was strip back both cables and again, this is after two weeks. So this is L1, this is L2, and down here I've got some pristine copper, so you can see it is untarnished. So what we're what we're seeing here, excuse me, is tarnishing of the copper, and this is not when we opened it up. This is happening uh, within the water, seawater, and again you can see 
that some of the strands on both of the wires are breaking. So if we again zoom in, um, I, I, hopefully that is visible to you, but you can see again, these broken breaking wires are not as a result of us stripping back the plastic. Here's, here's one wire that is being eroded through that electrochemical reaction. <coughs> Excuse me, and the wire is about to break. So again, this electrochemical reaction is is resulting from simply applying power, 220 volts to these two wires. There's nothing on the end of the wires. There's, there's no load or anything. All we're doing is applying a voltage between the two wires, and they both have an insulation resistance failure to to ground. And again. We, we see some of that original um, salt, um, sodium chloride on the wires, which again is just demonstrating that, that seawater is penetrating into the wires. So again, just zooming in, uh, you can see, uh, and this, you know, it's, it was easily seen. I think this was just taken with a, a 35 millimeter camera. You can see a couple of the strands of copper have broken through completely. Uh, and the third one you can see is is currently eroding and, and, and shortly will have broken through. So you can see what is happening. Um, as the copper is, is eroding or corroding, I should say, we're effectively reducing the cross-sectional area where e what each of those strands is is slowly corroding and breaking. And that means that the cross-sectional area of the copper is maybe changing. I don't know if it started out at six square mil, it, it keeps reducing. And at some point, it's not going to be able to carry the current that is being driven down to the, or supplied to the subsea consumers. So at some point, that cable is going to act like a fuse. So you have low insulation resistance. It may, maybe the insulation resistance is stable. Maybe it, it's 100 kilo ohms. It's stable. And you, your system's operating. Right, I'm going to keep an eye on my insulation resistance. But then, bang, all of a sudden, you lose power to subsea without any prior knowledge. So <clears throat> while you've had a low insulation resistance, you've slowly been eroding or corroding the copper. It ultimately, it turns itself into a fuse and then pops open and goes open circuit. At that point, you have no option but to replace the cable or, or the umbilical. Now, I wanted to get on to, you know, the, so I've told you the, the mechanism where low insulation resistance will ultimately result in a complete failure. Uh, may ultimately result in complete failure, I should say. What I've shown is worst case where all the copper loss is at a single point. If you have a excuse me, general water ingress along the length of cable, um, then the copper, uh, the copper loss is going to be uh, along the length of cable. And so the rate of reduction of the cross section area is going to be that much slower. But when you do get an insulation resistance failure, it ultimately leads to marine intervention costs, replacement of hardware costs, and as I've indicated, unplanned loss production. And most clients, and when I talk about clients, I'm talking about operators here, <coughs> most operators will work on the basis of when, not if they have an insulation resistance failure or a water ingress into their system. And so most of them will um, will plan for it and not just close their eyes and keep their system turned on and they ignore this key measure of IR or insulation resistance. The issue is, OK, your line insulation monitor is top sides. It is connected to the main umbilical. And I've, I've, this is a, a, a made up system, but you may have multiple faults. It may not just be a single fault. So, of course, <coughs> if you want to repair your system, you, you need to find out where your fault is. And your top side line insulation monitor, all it will do was indicate that you've got a fault somewhere. To diagnose where the fault is, 
it's a marine intervention. And on a system like this, it probably means a lot of disconnects and then reconnects subsea. And as you're probably aware, if your subsea system has been down for a few years, you have calcareous growth or marine growth around the connectors, you disconnect them. If the connector was good, by the time you put it back together again, it probably is not good. Excuse me. <coughs> so as a, a subsea operator, you have a challenge. Monitoring IR is not the only thing you need to do. So the, the this was a challenge which we, <coughs> excuse me, as a company faced. We had a number of clients in the North Sea who had one of, we we saw that one of their biggest problems was insulation resistance, electrical failures. Um, but the only solution when IR got to a low level or when the system failed was to go out, locate the problem and and replace the hardware. And if, if the hardware was an umbilical, so your umbilical has failed, the client then got into some commercial decisions because if you're close to end of field life, it may not be economically viable to replace the umbilical. And so a simple insulation resistance failure led to early abandonment of the field. So the consequences, commercial consequences were quite high. So Viper um, started brainstorming lots of different solutions um, and ways of getting around this. And, and we eventually came up with um, V-Life. Now, I've said it's a, a scientific breakthrough. Um, after we developed the concept, we, we went to universities for validating it. Uh, they did a whole load of uh, literature search and could find um, no background to the technique which we've come up with. <laughs> but this system has been in place since about 2013, so it is now a well a well-proven technology. And as you can see here, one of our first awards for it to, uh, was back in 2014. Um, we've won numerous awards uh, since on, on the technology and the impact it is having on a number of our clients. What is V-Life? Well, to apply V-Life, which is a special electrical signal uh, onto your, your umbilical, you have to have our line installation monitor, the VLIM installed. So if you've got someone else's, we have to pull that out, put ours in, or on the left-hand side, we have a portable system so that if <coughs> you, you don't change the entire rack, we can just come along and, and utilize a, a, a portable unit to ensure it works. So we install the hardware, we obtain data from the hardware, we modify the algorithms as a result of that hardware, and then we monitor um, the performance of the system on a monthly basis, and then uh, modify v, the, the VLive settings as, ne as necessary. So the hardware associated with providing um, this service is embedded in the VLIM, and then we have some special software running, uh, which which activates it and then modifies the the algorithms on a, a dynamic basis. The what I haven't told you yet is what V Life does, and and it effectively I'll show you some scanning electron microscope pictures, but it effectively finds the hole in the cable or where water is getting in. It drives the water molecules out through an electrokinetic technique. <coughs> and then we use an electrochemical technique to create a precipitate to block the hole. So, you know, what this is effectively, we are healing the cable uh, by blocking the hole where the water is getting in. As I've said on the final bullet point there, it is limited to floating ground, i.e. IT systems. <coughs> so that fits very well with the subsea, um, the norm of subsea systems. It can buy time. Um, 
In fact, if you'll excuse me, I think I've have I missed a slide. No. So it can buy time whilst the new umbilical is procured. It can be used instead of installing a new umbilical, postponing field abandonment, the example I've given you. And if you've got a system with a low IR, by applying um, V-Life, it will increase the insulation resistance and gives you more security maybe for adding additional wells, in, infill, infill wells or, or similar. It's not just umbilicals, it, it can be used to rejuvenate um, electrical flying leads, connectors, etc. So, as I said, let's just show you a picture of a, a real system. And this is one of our early installations, but it, it, I've had this slide for many years and I haven't bothered changing it. You can see up here that the original insulation resistance value was 150 kilo ohms. <clears throat> it was installed over Christmas in 2013, turned on just into the new year. And this is a trend of the measured insulation resistance. And you can see within three weeks, we got up to 100 mega ohms. So that is quite a significant um, increase in a very short period of time. Now, these peaks and troughs are absolutely normal. And it's part of the... Um, the algorithms within V-Life and the correction as it's as it's seeing what the effect of applying the signal is doing, it's self-correcting. So for instance, here, <coughs> it took some time for that drop to be corrected and then different signals apply to continue the upward trend. This is typical. We don't always achieve 100 mega ohms. Sometimes it'll get up to 500 mega ohms. Sometimes it'll get up to 50 mega ohms. It, all depends on the actual failure mode that we're trying to correct. Just typically, um, some some data we've got. We've had over 175 installations to date. Um, the installation resistance it, we, down to about 20 kilo ohms. We're we're relatively confident we can we can recover your system below this 20 23 kilo ohm figure it becomes a lot less likely that we can get enough energy in to, um, to get the system working. <coughs> Typically, we'd expect to get you up above 30 mega ohms. Um, as you can see there, we've you know, got 30 different operators, are our clients, and we've, we've accumulated over 380 years of operational experience with VeetLife. And right at the bottom, it's the first unit has been operational and stable since 2012. So what is it? Here's some experiments that the university did when they were evaluating it. So this, this black piece is actually the <coughs> insulation of a cable. And if we look uh, that hole is, it's about one millimeter from point to point, this crescent shaped hole. It was made with a pair of tweezers, but it goes all the way down to the copper, which is in the bottom. After we have applied V-Life, that same hole looks like that. So that's where the hole was. So you can see we, what we've actually done is filled the hole with this, this precipitate. And that has pushed the water out and effectively increase the insulation resistance and so now your <coughs> because your insulation resistance is high you don't have that copper loss or degradation of your your copper conductor i'll uh, very quickly just go through um, some insulation methods um, you know we we basically here's a rack where originally there were some uh, bender insulation resistance monitors uh, in the rack. We, we had to take it out in order to get our VLIM in. Once you've got your VLIM in, you can apply uh, VLIFE to, to that particular uh, channel. And then here's some <coughs> other installations. So we've got a whole series of interface panels so that 
we can replace, you know, not just that particular uh, style of, of insulation monitoring device, we can, we can replace a whole series through a, a range of in, interface modules. So it is a relatively quick process to take out what is already on uh, in the EPU, the electrical power unit, and replace with our own. I did um, <laughs> say that I would come back to um, this leakage current. And what you have to remember is that the rate of copper loss is directly proportional to that current. So, you know, if we look at uh, a, a, a system with 30 kilo ohms insulation resistance um, with a competitor's limit, 190 microamps is, is that current that's flowing and that for every microamp that's going, it's taking, it's taking copper. Um, if we replaced or, or, or replace that IMD with a Viper B limb and manage to get um, the insulation resistance up to 30 mega ohms, now your leakage current is just 30 microamps. And so we've got almost 15 times less copper loss. <coughs> if the original system was going to fail in a year, now you've given it a, li a, a life expectancy of 15 years. So um, effectively, by applying V-Life, what you are doing is extending the life expectancy of your cable. So you are now seeing why V-Life is called V-Life. And then I, I think down to my last but one slide um the other thing that we have done is um change that internal impedance in um uh, in the v limb so that obviously if you've got a very low um insulation resistance when you're going to get a whole load of leakage current we don't need to apply as much voltage to the cable so naturally what we've done if you just use a v-limb and don't apply v-life then we've gone as far as we can to minimize that um that copper loss that natural copper loss what we obviously can't do is if you have a insulation resistance failure uh in both cables when you apply a subsea voltage you are going to get a rapid rapid copper loss because we now got a very high voltage applied to the to the conductors and and obviously a, a rapid leakage current and and quite aggressive copper loss so <coughs> excuse me my summary slide low insulation resistance and use of a line insulation monitor or imd will result in copper loss applying a voltage to two subsea lines with two earth volts can create significant conductor damage and not just significant, but generally rapid conductor damage. Hydrogen generation is a byproduct of low IR and seawater on energized cables. Now, interestingly, um, there's a lot of theories running around that hydrogen being generated within the umbilicals, maybe corrosion of the, uh, of the steel wire armor, is somehow getting into the cable and causing low IR, i.e. it's a hydrogen that causes a low IR. I think you've hopefully seen from this presentation that the hydrogen is actually a byproduct and an indicator of uh, <coughs> low insulation resistance. So if you see hydrogen coming out or, or detect hydrogen coming out to the top of your umbilical, chances are it's as a result of low insulation resistance within the umbilical. If you apply V-Life, it results in, in less copper loss uh, and therefore uh, will extend your, your system life. And then finally, that V-Lim output, we do reduce the insulation, we reduce the output as the insulation resistance falls so that we do, under normal monitoring conditions, minimise this copper loss. So look, I really apologize for all my coughing. Uh, I'm just recovering from a cold and I was talking fine this morning. And typically as I start presenting, uh, the coughing starts. So sorry if that's uh, 
cause problems in your your viewing or listening, but I am now happy to take any questions. <laughs>